Brawls and beatdowns devolve in Washington, D.C. Big tech meets at Capitol Hill. U.S. troops withdraw from Afghanistan. And the Democrats push for student loan forgiveness. All of that and more after this clip. Help to speak about me at every single rally didn't really matter where he was. Um, sometimes multiple times in a day um, as he had held his Klan rallies throughout the country. So as you can see, our uh, very revered, uh, one of our favorite House of Representatives, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota in her district of Minnesota, uh, you know, she does not have the nicest thing to say about Trump supporters. She calls them essentially Klan members referring to Trump rallies as Klan rallies. And this is the kind of rhetoric that has been used to villainize and uh, dehumanize Trump supporters, which is which is what I want to talk about uh, to begin this to begin this here. This is going to be a current event video, as you can see. But the brawls and the beatdowns that devolved in Washington, D.C. This, this past weekend were a serious issue. It really does go to show the way in which uh, Trump supporters have been viewed by not only the media, but also by the Democrat Party. And you, if you look across all the platforms, I think Joe Biden just came out like two days ago or the other day, and he said that, you know, it was unacceptable or something like that. Something very soft and weak. From a very soft and weak-minded man, obviously, and, uh, you know, I don't hear anything really from the mainstream media or the uh, Democrats. And this just goes to show, this is, a, this is just a, a bigger picture of the way in which they view uh, Trump supporters and that type of rhetoric is what dehumanizes and vilifies them to the extent where anything's justified against them. That's why you see people attacking them in the streets, uh, people you know, taking their flags and, and whatever their gear is and, and burning it and lighting it on fire. And here's the thing, that's, that's, that's the first thing I really want to address is, do you think that by taking an American flag from somebody or a Trump hat, but more an American flag, you think taking an American flag, burning it, do you think that that somehow is going to end America American greatness, American ex exceptionalism. People believe in those core values. That is not something... These colors do not bleed. They do not fade. That is something that Americans believe in. And Americans, as long, as long as America lives, and even after it stops living, this will continue. This American dream, this American experience, the idea of self-government. It is something that cannot be taken away. It has already happened. <laughs> During in 1787, when they started that, when they ratified that constitution, at that point, fate has been sealed. You cannot take away these these core elements and these principles of self-government and American exceptionalism. This is something that is now inherent. This is something that every American, every freedom-minded individual yearns for in their soul. You cannot, by burning a flag or by having a new presidential candidate having just any you can have democrats straight across the board in the house of representatives and the in the senate doesn't matter who wins any of that stuff do you think that somehow it's just going to leave the minds of those freedom minded individuals you will just by burning a flag or even instilling your socialist or marxist ideology do you think that people will still not yearn for freedom i think they will those colors don't bleed they do not fade these are inherent principles of the American mind. They cannot be ended no matter what you do. You can attack Trump supporters. If it makes you feel better, it's not going to make a difference. It has already been done. It is already written. It will be in the history books for 250 years of American success and exceptionalism. And those principles will not die. They will go on generation and generation. America may end, but that self-governing principle and those values, they will never end. They will never die, even if America does so. So that damage has already been done just, just for your socialist. You, you scum out there, they go and attack people on the street and you think it's okay. And you justify your actions by calling people Nazis and dehumanizing them. It's disgusting. It's deplorable. It's egregious. And honestly, I don't even want to show the clips because it's just so disgusting. The fighting, and there is fighting on both sides, it's just disgusting. I don't even want to see it. I want to talk about political violence. It's terroristic. And um, that's it. You really cannot 
beat the American freedom-minded individual into submission, it will never happen. You're going to have to nuke us. That's what's going to have to happen, and it won't happen because you have about 74 million individuals that all believe the same way, and there's nothing that you can do to stop it no matter what you do, whether it's Gestapo tactics. Freedom is in the mind of every love it freedom loving american you can't do anything to stop it so and and if you want to you know if you look around think about this for a second socialism right the socialist ideology look all over the place it has not successfully been done anywhere and it's totalitarian uh in the in these totalitarian regimes and even in its totality it has never been successfully done anywhere Meanwhile, you still have people running around advocating. Do you think the greatest system that has ever been brought to man, the free market, freedom, principle of self-government, do you think that that somehow will die with America? We can't even kill the idea of socialism. You think that the greatest principle in governance ever created by man will eventually die. Even if the country dies, it's not going to die. It will continue on for generations and generations. It will be almost folkloristic if it ever does die and it will always be around for all of you uh you globalists out there that believe in total control and despotic behavior <clears throat> so i'm going to continue speaking of despotic behavior big tech meets a capitol hill and i have some receipts here now this is an article written by the independent uh it's quoting Zuckerberg. We plan for this, Zuckerberg says, uh, talking about Trump's false claim victory. Now, what you're going to see is you're going to be a, see a giant disparity between Republicans and Democrats here. Mike Lee, a uh, Democrat, I mean a Republican senator from Utah, accused Twitter and Facebook of talk, taking a distinctive, distinctively uh, partisan approach. And they're flagging of misleading material, which is true because I have seen a lot of uh, anti, you know, Trump fan stuff. I've seen a lot of just very, very bad uh, phrasing online, negative comments about Trump people talking about violence. That is something that has not been silenced at all. It has not been taken down. I have not seen it taken down, but I have seen it. Uh, now, if it was the other way around, you know, it would quickly be taken down by Twitter or there would be, you know, like a censorship, like they've been doing to the president, putting little things under under his um, his comments on Twitter. Ted Cruz says that uh, he accused Twitter of editing and silencing reporters, which which they did with with the uh, the New York Post piece about uh, Hunter Biden. That's exactly what they did. So the things that the accusations are pretty solid here. They they presented a lot of evidence. I don't want to go into. Uh, a lot of particulars because I have a lot to get to, but I just want to show you the disparity. And then also, he, um, Ted Cruz cited the example of Twitter fl not flagging uh, the New York Times when they published Donald Trump's tax records, which is another thing they did not do, or the Edward Snowden tweets. That's another thing. And then Marsha Blackburn, Senator of Tennessee, she's a Republican, she said, You have used this power to run amok. You have proven that you do not have the strength, the ability to regulate yourselves, which is true. Uh, Lindsey Graham, a chair from the Senate Judiciary Committee, also a Republican, uh, he's the one that alluded to the Hunter Biden laptop. If you are not a newspaper, why do you have editorial control over the New York Post? Which is a very good question, because whenever they come and they ask these people when they come to Capitol Hill, Mark Zuckerberg, as well as Jack Dorsey, who is the CEO of Twitter, they always have the same, oh, well, we try to follow our policies, we try to do this, we try to so uh, follow Section 230. They give them the smooth fest, and they've gone up to Capitol Hill multiple times. At this point, it's probably got to be their fifth or sixth time, and it's the same thing every time they talk about partisan politics and how they're considered, you know, a platform, but they're acting like a publisher because they're taking down certain uh, disagreeable, disagreeable uh, views online. Now, that event essentially makes them an editor it does not make them a platform and now if you're an editor then you're be, you're becoming you're now liable for every single tweet on your site that's essentially what it means you can't just pick and choose what political speech you like and what political speech you don't like so that's why they're calling for ch uh changes to section 230 and here is the stark comparison 
between what Republicans are talking about and then this is what Democrats come back with. You got Senator Dianne Feinstein of California. She's a Democrat, ranking Democrat. She's at the very top of the seniority list. I, I believe she's like, I mean, she's been in government about as long as Joe Biden has. And she says whether their labeling of tweets did enough to prevent the tweets harm pointing to uh, President Trump's tweets about the election. And then the response that you get from uh, Jack uh, Dorsey is we have labeled the tweets that would indicate a different result in the election, which have been called by multiple sources. And then she says back, my concern is that these tweets arouse people. The tweets can play a unique role in reassuring or stirring people up to an unacceptable level. And Dorsey answers back, agreed in spirit, but then he defended Twitter's policy, saying it directed Twitter users to further information instead of completely taking down the tweet, which is at least much more respectable than taking down the tweet, which is that's what the difference between Republicans and Democrats here is such a stark comparison. You have Republicans calling for, hey, we need more and more free speech. Democrats are saying, hey, we need to shut down speech. And then their answer is because Trump, Trump supporters are violent and we're worried about these people being stirred up stirred up that's that's what the answer is so you're telling me right after i just walked watch an entire weekend where trump supporters got the crap beaten out of them outdoors uh in dc just trying to show their support for the current president in this in this election everything that's going on with this election all these claims of fraud there's this litigation and they just got beaten up all the whole night they got chased down i saw uh, videos of families getting chased down by these by these BLM as well as these Antifa members, thug criminal losers, just beating up innocent people. And now we're saying that's the vi- that is the violent side. The side getting beaten up. And we have to watch out for them. So, <clears throat> and, and I'm also going to allude to this here too. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg was asked about the Stop the Steal movement trending on his platform, and he said he was extremely worried about the potential for people to try to overturn the election by violent means, exactly what I was just alluding to. Trump supporters, bad, violent, racist, horrible, uh, clan members. And it's just... Let me tell you, I mean, you gotta be disappointed... If you got to be pretty livid if you're a uh, if you're a Trump supporter if you're a conservative you got to be pretty pretty po you got to be pissed off with this stuff for sure uh, you know you have people shutting you down all these different platforms now Republicans are running to Parler they're running to Rumble they're rejecting these original uh, social media platforms. Because these social media platforms are doing that that classic uh, pejorative southern accent making fun of people that vote Republican. Oh, I'm a dumb racist. I'm a dumb redneck idiot. <laughs> That's pretty much what's going on on these uh, Capitol Hill meetings. And then... Then you go out to a uh, you go out to a rally. They call you a Klan member. And then you get beat up by an opposing, you know, an opposing view who dress up like thugs and have done this before before COVID-19 was a thing. They always wore masks because they hid in the dark like cowards because they're losers. So, next next topic of discussion here I have. You got... You got the U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Republicans are alarmed by withdrawal plans because the Trump administration is looking to withdraw troops just a couple days before uh, the next uh, inauguration of whoever the next president is going to be, whether it ends up being Trump or it ends up being Biden. He's going to be pulling them out, I want to say, like January 16th or something like that. Now... In Iraq, the number of U.S. troops will be cut from 500 to, it will be cut by 500, and it'll be 2,500. So I guess it was 3,000 uh, U.S. troops in Iraq. They're going to cut them by 500, thus making them 2,500. While the number of service personnel in Afghanistan will fall from 4,500 to about 2,500. So that's a cut of about 3,000 right across the board. We're trying to lower our uh, presence in the Middle East after you know 20 years of war. And I have a lot of numbers. 
Now, this article is from BBC, what I'm reporting on. Now, I have two different BBC articles. I have one just talking about this because there's a lot of Republicans that are in disagreement because, you know, a lot of these establishment Republicans are interventionalists. They believe in the in the military industrial complex, just like a lot of these Democrats now suddenly are when this used to be a bipartisan issue. But as soon as Donald Trump decided to pull people out of out of the Middle East, now suddenly it's a partisan issue. Now it's suddenly, I guess, Republicans want to pull out of the Middle East and Democrats want to stay and they want to occupy the zone for God knows what reason. They want to just continue to send our people out to go get killed and then spend countless and countless amounts of, of U.S. dollars, of taxpayer-funded U.S. dollars in order to, you know, build a regime that eventually falls. Everything we've done so far has been completely and utterly unsuccessful over there. We have done nothing that has been conducive to the people there. We have occupied the zone for about 20 years. You have people that are walking patrol routes that their father may have walked 20 years ago. That's currently what's going on. We have a bunch of soldiers and and Marine Corps uh, members right now in the Middle East that literally don't even know or weren't even alive for 9-11. That's currently what we have going on, and somebody wants to actually pull them out, and we have a bunch of Republicans getting upset and angry with it. Now, to now the U.S. Defense Secretary Chris Miller said the move reflected Mr. Trump's policy to bring the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq to a successful and responsible conclusion and to bring our brave service members home. So, here I got a visual I'm going to throw up there for you. Uh, U.S. troop levels in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2019, as you can see during the Obama administration, we were at our peak around 110,000 members we had in Afghanistan. And then once uh, around 2014 to 2015, you see a huge drop. And then you see Trump come in. It stays at a, at a pretty much an all-time low if you really look amongst an administration. It definitely was at an all-time low around 10 to 20,000. Now, the U.S. cost of war in Afghanistan, another visual I got up there for you. <clears throat> if you watch, if you look, this is in the billions. So you're going to see from 2001 to 2007, the average was around maybe $15 billion a year. And then you see a huge jump from 2008 up until 2015 during the Obama administration. We were spending astronomical amounts of money in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the two biggest years is 2011 and 2012, where it looks like it's 97 and 98 billion dollars in those, in both of those years, 97 and 98 billion. And as the Trump administration took over these last couple of years, it's, it's fluttered around 38 billion a year. So that's about half. (laughs) It's amazing. And according to the U.S. Department of Defense, the total military expenditure in Afghanistan from October 2001 to September 2019 was $778 billion. So we have almost spent a trillion dollars on a war in in just Afghanistan alone. That doesn't even have to do with what we did in Iraq. In addition, the U.S. State Department, along with the U.S. Agency for International Development, Another government agency spent $44 billion on reconstruction projects. So these, this is the reconstruction that I was talking about that pretty much fell to the floor and didn't, didn't end in anything uh, conducive at all. That brings the total cost, based on the official data, to $822 billion since the war began in 2001. But it doesn't include any spending in Pakistan, which the U.S. uses... As, the, as a base for Afghan-related operations. So that is only in uh, Afghanistan. Independent study carried out by Brown University Cost of War Project argues that the official U.S. figures for the Afghan war are a substantial underestimate. They are saying, it says that Congress has approved funds amounting to about $1 trillion for Afghanistan as well as for Pakistan. Now... So, I mean, I'd like to chalk it up that we we're, we paid at least a trillion. According to Brown University Cost of War Project, we paid two trillion because we paid one in uh, one trillion in Afghanistan and one trillion in Pakistan. So, you know, here's here's people that talk about the military industrial complex. It's such a bad thing. It's supposed to be a bipartisan issue. Uh, Trump decides to pull troops out and now suddenly it's a huge problem. And and it's amazing that it's even covered as a problem from either side it really shouldn't be uh 
it's just so ridiculous all the money that we spend on on interventionalist uh, globalism garbage that everybody knows is trash that we shouldn't be spending and then because trump doesn't now you turn around and now it's you know now it's a problem we think that we need to somehow hold these zones that we really don't have any entitlement to hold it's just it's absurd and it's it shouldn't even be an issue but it is an issue i'm going to continue we got some now this is this is something that is very interesting it's being pushed for by a bunch of people along with the free health care as well as the $15 minimum wage, which $15 minimum wage, just for a quick uh, synopsis of the way that ends up working, $15 minimum wage ends up putting people out of work because it prices them out of the market. The reason that the politicians like the idea of a $15 minimum wage, it sounds good, it helps them win votes, and then when they do it, it makes people want to vote for them more because these people don't really understand that they get laid off because of the $15 minimum wage. Now, when I worked at, I worked at a pizza place, I worked at a Little Caesars, just to explain this the best way I can. I was getting paid at that time when I first started working, man, I was getting paid minimum wage, I was getting paid seven twenty five an hour, eventually got up to nine twenty five an hour when I was a supervisor, and then I eventually left to go work at Costco, just because they were paying me more. Now... At seven twenty-five, let's say they were paid. They pay me now. They're pushing me up to fifteen bucks an hour. Fifteen bucks an hour. If you work a forty-hour week uh, all year long, it's around thirty k a year. Now they could have bought, and at this time they did. They had a machine that sauced and cheesed and made the entire. They dressed the whole pizza. That machine, if that machine cost them twenty thousand dollars, why in the heck would they hire me and keep me employed for fifteen bucks an hour to do that job when they can just fire me? pay to get the machine, they save themselves $10,000 the first year alone, and then after that, they're saving themselves 30000 every single year, I mean, minus repairs, but the repairs aren't going to amount to $30,000, why wouldn't the owners do that, that's what ends up happening when you raise the minimum wage, you price people out of a job, their, their work that they're currently doing is not worth $15 an hour, therefore, they end up getting laid off, because it is unaffordable. To especially, you want to talk about big business and small business. This sounds like a huge move. The Democrat Party is helping biz, big business every single time they raise the minimum wage because guess who, who can actually afford to pay that minimum wage hike? It is going to be the big business. Small business will go out of business, and then the big business will just take over their employees, and they'll take over all of their, of their uh, consumers, and they'll make even more money. So once you go and you raise a minimum wage, you give a minimum wage hike, it only kills small businesses. It does not kill these big businesses. Big corporations always find a way to survive. They always have the, the deep wallets, the deep pockets. They can hire people to, to make those adjustments to their business model, and they will have zero issues. So that's something that does help. Just like I said, open borders helps big corporations. the same thing, same policy. It also helps uh, big corporations. These open borders end up lowering the value of of uh, the work so you have a bunch of people that, that come into the country that are unskilled laborers it ends up lowering the value of that work so, you know why would i pay this guy eleven dollars an hour on the books when i could pay this other dude seven dollars an hour off the books so really so if anybody's on in the lower class or not even lower class just on less skilled um without a college degree you're going to get screwed by policies like that, $15 minimum wage. as And then not only that, but when you, you hike a minimum wage, $15 an hour, what you're doing is you're getting rid of a market mechanism. Market naturally sets the price, the market. The value for that labor is naturally set by market incentives. When you raise the minimum wage to $15, you are artificially throwing a wrench into the market. It will screw with all of the prices. Your eggs are now not $2 a dozen. They're now going to be $3 a dozen. You're going to see an extra dollar on milk. You're going to see an extra... Everything ends up going up, artificially going up, let me mind you. So you're going to see you're going to see more and more people lose their jobs. You're going to pay more money for goods. And the big corporations are going to get stronger. That's a pol- that is a $15 minimum wage policy, in essence. And those are st- statistically that is a thing too. I will get deeper. I think maybe next episode I'll do something on the minimum wage, just so then I can uh, bring up more and more data, and you can view the average how many people get laid off or get their hours cut once you come through with a uh, minimum wage hike.
of a fifteen dollar hike, which is so insane. I mean, New Jersey, it's already eleven. I mean, I was working when it was seven twenty five, and that was only that was less than ten years ago. So now the Brookings, I have a, I have an article from the Brookings Institute here, and this uh, this talks about all of the student loan debt because we we have. I have an article here too as well, and it's from Washington Examiner. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll hit this first. This is the talks about uh, the House and the Senate leaders. They're talking about a coronavirus aid package. They've yet to get to a deal. Seems like they're not going to. They're going to wait to see, I think, what happens with, with Trump in this election. And then maybe they'll work on a deal after that. I'm not really sure. Because also, I mean, you got Pfizer and Moderna just both came out with, with – uh, vaccines that are 90 plus percent effective so they're highly effective they've never even seen numbers like that coming out the gate with a uh, vaccine so the democrats they're looking for 3.4 trillion dollar package in spending for stimulus and uh, republicans are looking at 500 billion which is a half trillion Uh, they're not even close (laughs) obviously so democrats lowered their proposal to 2.2 trillion they, it was a reduction of 1.2 trillion, so 2.2 trillion and 500 billion, which still really aren't even close. I mean, you know, that's four times more than what the Republicans want to spend, and I'll tell you why. It's because, and this, all, all these, all these spending bills the Democrats have been coming out with this entire time. This one's actually the biggest one I've seen. I think they had one at 1 trillion or 1.5 trillion or 2 trillion, but I've never seen 2.2 or 3.2. This is actually the largest one I think that they've come out with now in these negotiations. And this one here, what we're looking at is 2.2 trillion. I mean, the last time I read, because there's been so many proposals put up, but the last one I read, it was a full trillion dollars we're going to end up going we're going to end up going to just state governance. So what the Democrats are doing right now is really, this is a, a cover-up on how poorly they've governed their states over, and, and big cities over the last, you know, 10, 10 years maybe. So all this money, we have a full trillion dollars just to bail them out, and then they make the excuse of, oh, well, coronavirus. Nope, that's not the way it works. It's been like this. These big cities, these, these Democrat-run states, these state budgets, for example, New Jersey's budget is deep in the gutter. Uh, they were talking about getting rid of pensions for, for police officers or lowering the percentage. I mean, if you're living in New Jersey, you're a cop, you're making a 65% pension, which is insane. No one's making pensions like that. Like, if you're a state employee or if you're a, a township employee, your pensions are insane. They don't have any pension fund systems like that in, you know, uh, states like Texas or states like Florida. Their pension funds are not blown out that way, and that's why they're able to balance their budget every year. And that's why, actually, sometimes Texas will come through with a surplus in their state rent. And they don't even have, guess what, no income tax, just state sales tax, which I think is around like 7 7.5%. That's it. And then you got your property tax as well. But it's nowhere near the property tax that's here in New Jersey. It's maybe maybe half, not even. So the reason in which we are having all these issues in a state like New Jersey is because we have these insane blown out pension funds. We also have an increasing infrastructure in the school system. You see, it's not school teachers that are the problem. The problem are the administrators, the people that sit around and don't actually teach the kids. That has increased sixfold since the 90s. We have seen an increase of administrators in in the uh, school system. I think this is throughout America, not only Jersey. You're going to see a six-time increase in the personnel, just in the administrative uh, positions, which are people that are in charge. When I went to school, I never had to deal with an administrator until I had to actually make my schedule. So I dealt with them maybe one hour the entire year, and they're getting paid big bucks because they are, they have graduate degrees. A lot of them, they're in the master's or they have doctorates, which they give them incentives. They give them extra bonuses for having that education that they really don't even use because they're not teaching uh, students. The real money should be made from the teachers. It should not be made from the administrators that sit down on a computer most of the day. That's just my personal opinion. I'm sure there's a lot of people that also agree with that. So you see 2.2 trillion. So... Last time I checked, a trillion of that of those dollars at least were going to uh, state governments that failed, and they're all Democrats. State governments obviously that failed because they're they're blowing the spending out of the water, and then. Last time I looked at it, it was something, it was such a ridiculous number. It was like, I'm not even kidding when I say this, it was something like $10 billion 
went to small businesses. But if you have a proposal of $2 trillion and you got $10 billion of the dollars going to small businesses and then you got the other trillion going to um, all these failed governance programs and then the rest of the money, I think, went to some sort of supplement like how we got that $1,200 paycheck, some sort of supplement for the American people. Something, something to pay off certain renters. I mean, stuff like that. But here's, here's what the the root cause. This is the root issue for anyone that um actually pay pays attention to these plans. I don't mind me personally. I would not actually even. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of these of these big spending bills and these stimulus bills. But I do think it is contingent upon the government to do something, considering they're the ones that shut everybody down, especially some of these state governments. It is not a Donald Trump. It is not a national or federal issue. The federal government did not shut anybody down. People that are blaming the president for it just are ignorant and don't know what they're talking about. The real issue is you have state governors that shut down many, many businesses. And in doing so, they are now liable. They have to figure it out. This money, this two trillion, I wouldn't even mind if it was if you told me, hey, it's a two point two trillion dollar spending bill, but it's going straight to the American people and American biz small businesses that had issues staying open because the because the tyrannical governor decided to shut down their business, I'd be completely okay with that. I'd eat the bullet all day on that. And I don't even like spending. I'm not a big fan of of the government spending that goes on, but at least at least that you know what that would make these governors too that would actually give us some sort of pride in our politicians that they actually are of their word and they really do care about the American people but as you can see it's not about that it's about partisan politics and it's about making your party look better by giving them a government subsidy of one trillion dollars so the the Republicans this entire time all their money has actually been that they've been allocating has been for the American people the media is not going to tell you that you can look it up yourself I have read many many articles I have one here that I'm going to leave I'm going to leave in the description. It is that uh, Washington Examiner article, but it has been, it's something that they can't, they can't agree on the money. I'm not okay with paying for these, for fronting the bill because the last 10 years, these Democrat uh, senators, these Democrat uh, governors or these mayors, whoever ran these cities spent the town, the city or the state into a complete and utter abyss. I'm not okay with bailing people out. That's not that's not what the federal government's for. You shouldn't be taking money from people that are responsible to pay because other people are irresponsible. So that's that article. I started with that one first because that is in relation to the next article here. And it's for the student loan debt. So this is funny because the student loan debt, and I'll show you with, with stats. I have receipts. I have an article from the Brookings Institute. This this proposal from, uh, I think it's Schumer. You got Schumer, and then you also got Elizabeth Warren. Um, what do they call her? I don't remember. The Native American, the fake Native American Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> it's a fraud. A fraud of epic proportions. And doesn't get called out on her, you know, where she tries to act like she's Native American, where she really isn't. She fakes her ethnicity. Just to be look like she's woke or intersectional, and no one calls her out on it when they really should. But that's that's when you're a Democrat, you get covered up by the media. The media has your back all day. They don't care. It is what it is. So President uh, President Elect Biden, it says here, and this is in a uh, Fox News article. So like I said, if anybody that thinks Fox News is right leaning, they're not because they're calling Joe Biden already the President Elect. When they have not yet to call the election and the electors have not voted, electors vote on December 14th, then you can call him president-elect. And there's been no conceding from the Trump administration. But I'm going to continue. Now, Joe Biden said that there should be immediate congressional action. Uh, people are actually calling for him to do an executive order using the Higher Education Act of 1965. I mean, I've been reading the act. I don't really know how he could possibly how he could really pull an executive order and decide to pay $50,000 of student debt per borrower. I don't even know where he's going to get the money in the budget or the plan in order to do that, where that money's allocated. It's about $1.7 trillion. That's how much uh, student loan debt there is out there. And um, it was an Elizabeth Warren plan as well as a Schumer plan. Apparently, they had this planned out if she was, I guess, to win uh, the presidential 
nomination. They were going to plan this out. This was going to be one of her to- talking points. Obviously, she didn't win. But now they're talking about vanquishing $50,000 of student loan debt. Now, if you're a... Best part is, is this is a bailout for rich people. And I'll show you why in a couple of uh, minutes here. But it's it's amazing. If you're somebody that went into into trades, if you went to join an electrician union, you've been working as a plumber, you've been doing uh, laying sheetrock, you've been... If you're somebody that went to a trade school, if you're a mechanic, I have a buddy that's a mechanic, uh, you know, the guy can pretty much take anything apart and put it back together. Uh, if, if you went into any of those occupations, you get screwed. You have to now pay for these kids that went to college for stupid majors. And now this also stems back to the exact same, the exact same philosophy or the same, same theory that I had about the government raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. When you go and you decide to give out government loans to anybody that can never be, they can be paid back, they cannot be, uh, if you went and declared bankruptcy, you filed for bankruptcy, guess what? Those college loans, you still got to pay off. If they're federal government loans, you still have to pay those loans off. Now, the reason that college has increased so much in price it has increased three times the inflation price since the 90s is because the government decided to give out loans now the government gave out loans because they thought everyone had had a right to uh an education and the same educational opportunities but the difference is is when you go and you get let's say uh you go to school for engineering engineering you could probably get a private loan you probably don't need to really actually go go to the government for that loan because you go to the the bank and this is the reason that there is a market. This is the reason there's market uh, incentives, and this is the reason that the market should really, should really determine the price of things. Because if you are going to school for an engineering degree, the bank looks at it as an investment. They say, okay, we're going to lend this kid hundred thousand dollars. He's going to go to school for four years to get that degree, and he's going to pay us back at an interest rate of you know whatever the percentage is. Let's say it's ten percent. Let's say the interest rate is just for just for uh, to make the math easier. Now, that kid gets out of school. The average earning potential for somebody that gets out of school with an engineering degree, let's say 60000 70000 so they know that this kid will be able to pay back the money if they get out with an engineering degree. So the bank is willing to give him, because it is, like I said, it's an investment for the bank to do so. So they go and they give him this $100,000 loan. He ends up paying it back, paying it back over the years. I keep saying he because I actually know somebody that's an engineer. That's why, because I'm thinking about them in specifically. Now, you go to school for a, a liberal arts degree, it costs the exact same price. It costs $100,000. If you go to a bank and try to get that private loan, you're not going to get it. They're not going to give it to you because it's an investment for them, and they know that somebody that gets out of school with a liberal arts degree usually averages around, let's say, $40,000 a year. So they look, they go, wow, this investment's going to take us a while to get our money back. This isn't worth an investment for us. And that's if they get a job coming out of college. They might not get a job. Their chances are, are much lower than somebody that comes out with an engineering degree, a mechanical engineering degree. So what they did was they decided to make government government loans. Government got into the business of loans. So in doing so, guess what happened? All of the colleges raised the price of school because they said, who cares, government is fronting the bill. Kids, as long as they get the government to pay for them, they will still go to college because it is something that has been uh, promulgated in our society as, as, a, as a net good, as a positive, as if you don't go to college, you're, I guess, some sort of nitwit. It is something that is, is very coveted and revered amongst our society a little bit too much. Uh, so now they're giving out loans for any major. It can be a underwater basket weaving major. It doesn't matter. They will still give you a government loan for it. You will still pay 100 That's another thing is straight across the board, most of it's the same. If you go, which it wouldn't be if it weren't for the government giving out loans, if it was a private loan system, they would charge you more depending on what your degree is. If if you're going to school for a doctorate in, uh, you know, jurisprudence, or you're going to school for a doctorate in the medical field, and and somebody else is going to school for a liberal arts major, those are not going to cost the same. They're not going to be the the exact same price if they're both bachelor's degrees. Let's say just to say that you know because one. There's much more of a profit incentive once you get out of school. You're going to be making more money, so it's much more of a valuable uh, education to have to be attained. But the government, by getting involved in in these loans and these in this debt, 
they really they screwed everyone in the school system because they jacked the prices up like i said three times the, with even including the inflation rate it's gone up three times the price of going to college so they they really once you get throw a, once you throw a wrench in the in the market based system where the, you let the market because guess what you know what happens guess what happens when you're when you're charging thirty thousand dollars a year to go to school so that's a four year one hundred twenty thousand dollar tuition rate and you guess what happens when people realize that it's not worth going to school they're not going to be able to pay that debt off the schools will have to lower their prices. It will have to happen in order for them to survive because then no one would be going to college. Now the system they have is the government fronts the bill and they just continue to jack the prices up because the government's paying for it. That's why there's so much student loan debt because the government got involved. And it's all student loan debt that you really can't that you cannot pay off and now they're talking about, oh, we're gonna we're gonna give them fifty thousand dollars, relinquish the debt. In doing so, guess what happens? These big businesses, these big, uh, these big colleges, they make off, make out with everyone's money, and they run away into the sunset. And then you have the same problem coming up in a couple more years because the system has not been fixed. It is a broken system that, instead of being fixed and some sort of reformation of that system, all you do is you relinquish the debt, and that's it. And then the debt just continues to build back up again. It's it's. It's a total mess. Everything the government gets their hands on, they pretty much screw up. So I'm going to continue here. We got the Brookings Institute, and the uh, article is, Who Owes the Most in Student Loans? New data from the Fed. And that was uh, October 9th, 2020, so it's pretty relative, about a month ago. And uh, it says, Most news stories and reports about student debt cite the fact that Americans owe more than $1.5 trillion the fact that households in the upper half of the income distribution and those with graduate degrees hold a disproportionate share of that debt almost never makes it into the narrative. So what are they talking about here? They're saying higher income earners. The highest income 40% of households, those with incomes above 74000 So you got the highest income 40% of households owe almost 60% of the outstanding education debt and make almost three quarters of the payments. So they're, they're, it's the forty, the top 40% of income earners, they owe 60% of the outstanding education debt. The lowest income, 40% of households, hold just under 20% of the outstanding debt and make only 10% of the payments. So so that weight of actual payments is they're only paying 10% of that debt off the, the lowest 40% income. So really, most of the payments, most of this debt is owned by richer people. So when you go to relinquish this debt, it is a rich people... Uh, <laughs> You are helping the rich people. You are giving them money. And, and these, these people that are at the top, here's another thing that's very important. 56% of all outstanding education debt is from graduate degrees. So it's people getting their master's, getting their doctorates. An increase from 49% in 2016. So it's actually more uh, of that, of that uh, debt that education debt is people from graduate degrees, 56% compared to 49% just a couple, four years ago in 2016. For context, only 14% of adults age 25 or older hold graduate degrees. The 3% of adults with professional doctorate degrees hold 20% of the education debt. So 20%, so one-fifth of the education debt is owed by 3% of adults with professional and doctorate degrees. You got people with with masters and people with doctor degrees, they pay twenty percent. They owe twenty percent. So it's it's these households have median earnings more than twice as high as the overall median earnings. So their median earnings is one hundred and six thousand compared to forty seven thousand that we were talking about before. So this this year, this relinquishment of college debt will benefit the top forty percent earners in the country the richer people are pretty much getting a cut and you're going to find also that these people come from households where their parents are also uh have have those types of degrees those master masters or those doctorate degrees that's also in this article here i'll leave everything in the uh, description 
but we're really they're pushing it's just amazing because those are who the donors are for the democrat party even though people like to think it isn't if you go and you look at who had the big donors who had the big money behind them it was joe biden it was not donald trump donald trump had a lot of his money was coming from individual uh people giving you know ten dollars here you know 15 bucks there it was primarily all of most of the donations for for Biden, these big money dom- donations were coming from these Forbes, you know, 500 company, like these huge companies. There was only one or two really that gave to Donald Trump because they do not like, like I said, they don't like, you know, a closed border. A lot of these big companies, and if you'll notice the Wall Street Journal, they are much more social, socially left when it comes to uh, border control. And that's because the Wall Street Journal is run by rich dudes. And, um, like I said before, I've been, I've been saying it seems like the Republican Party is becoming more and more of the working class uh, worker. The working class voter is becoming more and more of the Republican Party because it seems like the policies that are being pushed by the Republican Party are the ones that are benefiting the middle class worker much more than what's going on with the Democrat Party where they're pushing to, you know, we're, we're pushing to help the big businesses out with uh, a minimum wage hike. And then we're also pushing to help the richer half of America pay their college debt. So if you're somebody that went, if you're someone that went to a trade school and really made the the, the smart financial decision, if you looked at your aptitude and you said, hey, you know, school's not for me. I'm going to go for a trade. I'm going to learn how to work with my hands. Maybe I'm even going to be a business owner. I'm going to I'm going to learn how to. You know, I have, I have a friend now that currently he went to school with me and he learned that, you know, he didn't want to do that. And now he wants to go on his own and be, you know, learn a trade almost like a plumber or learn how to lay sheetrock and do things like that. Renovate houses, make money that way. And, you know, that's what he wants to do now. Now, now should he and he's somebody that already paid for his college tuition. Right. So now he's responsible for paying for someone else's college tuition. It's a screwed up policy. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how they're going to get it done. Especially, they're definitely not going to get it done through an executive order. That's why um, Joe Biden said that there needs to be legislative action because I don't think that he he must be getting word from his handlers and lawyers that are involved in his uh, in his team saying that he's not going to be able to constitutionally do it. So uh, that's it for this one. I appreciate you for tuning in. There's going to be another Federalist Paper video tomorrow. And uh, make sure you like, share, subscribe. If you like the content, comment. I got my email in there. You can follow me on any of the uh, social medias I have up there as well. Uh, Make sure you drop the mic. Let people know about the podcast. And if you have any additional information for any new videos or ideas, just shoot me an email. I would appreciate it. And uh, thank you for tuning in. I will see everyone on Friday.